afflictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world Shine.
Welcome to Revival Church. He is risen. We are so honored to have you here to worship our God together on this Easter Sunday morning. May the risen Christ fill you with his living water. Our groups, or small groups, meet every other week. If you are interested in meeting in a smaller and more intimate setting, please join our small group gathering by contacting info at revivalchurchoc.com. Our next encounter meeting or a night of praise and prayer will be held this coming Friday, April 22nd at 7.30 p.m. God answers our prayers. Please join us if you need a special prayer and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. The location will be at Pacific Church of Irvine. Night of Lift the Vision. All sisters, come and join us for a fun and encouraging night of lift or women's ministry gathering on April 23rd, 7 p.m. at Pacific Church of Irvine. And now, here is our lead pastor, Stephen Chong. Uh, so great to see everyone. Uh, and again, we want to make sure that perfect love, the perfect love of God casts out all fear. I want to make sure that any visitors, newcomers, it's your first time here, but we are so honored and blessed that you chose to worship on Easter Sunday morning with us. And so I want to ask all those who call Revival Church their home church, I want to make all our newcomers feel so loved that by the time they go home, they're like, I felt so loved by God. So can we give them one more time a big, big shout and a hand clap of praise. Let's show the love of Christ to them. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And point to someone maybe you haven't seen or you don't know very well. Point to that person and say, you're an answer to prayer. You're an answer to prayer. And we're not lying. Uh, I'm using a young term. That I heard in text messaging young kids say, no cap, to say that they're speaking the truth, right? So when we say that uh, you're an answer to prayer, no cap, we're telling the truth because we have been praying for you. We've been praying uh, that you will get notification, whether through mailer or social media, or your, one of our church folks invited you, or you maybe just strolled on in. You're an answer to prayer because we've been praying for you to come, not only the church, but to encounter the love and the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, can I get an amen from Revival Church right here? So that's why you're an answer to prayer. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us. My name is Pastor Stephen. I'm the pastor of this amazing church. And when I talk, say church, I'm not talking about a Sunday service. I'm talking about all the precious people that God has gathered to be a part of God's local church family here. So uh, I started this church about uh, a little over eight years ago with my wonderful wife and my partner in crime. All right, crime in a sense of doing what's, what's breaking the mold and doing what's right. And so we're so grateful to have you. Please don't leave right after service as you saw the programs and the wonderful food. We have tacos, all right? So, um, and, uh, but you do need that meal ticket, all right? So uh, please make sure you don't lose it, all right? And uh, join us for a wonderful festive time. Uh, we'd love to connect with you. And also newcomers, we have a VIP table in the area, uh, in the eating area. Please join us right there as well. Well, today for Easter, um, I'm going to be giving an Easter message. And today it's found in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. And uh, one tradition that we do, and I want to just forewarn all the newcomers. Um, you know, for Revival folks, they see me normally in a T-shirt and jeans. I dressed up for Easter today, all right? So, uh, and so it's, it's I want to forewarn all newcomers. I get excited about God's word, so I, I can get a little passionate, if you will, about the love of Jesus Christ. So um, point to someone and say, he's not a quiet one. He's not a quiet one. So I tend to be a little louder, so just want to forewarn you about that because you get loud at Angels games or Lakers games. Uh, some of you got cra went crazy at BTS concerts, so uh, why not we get louder about the Lord Jesus Christ? Can I get an amen to that, all right? So I just get to be a little louder, so, and, uh, and we also have a call and response. And one other tradition that we do is we stand up because we really take God's word seriously. It's God's truth, timeless, eternal. Uh, man's idea of truth changes here and there with each generation, but God's truth is timeless and timely and eternal. So we like to honor God's word as the final authority over our lives. So uh, we'd like to do that by standing up for the reading of God's holy word. So can we all stand up right now? Let's all stand up for the reading of God's holy word. And today for the Easter Sunday message is found in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. I'll be reading from the NIV version. If you just silently read along, 
and I'll read it out loud. Here now is the reading of God's holy word. On the first day of the week, everybody say first day. Very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Everybody say the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Verse 4, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men, the other uh, versions of, of the gospel says they were angels. But the men or angels said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? In verse 6, he is not here. He has risen. Oh, can I get an amen to that? Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. And verse 7, the Son of Man, that is Jesus Christ, must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Before you sit down, I want to bring to you the sermon title and the main idea for this Easter 2022 message here today. I want to bring to you the sermon title and the main idea of hope from a tomb. Hope from a tomb. Everybody take your right hand and fingers. We like to be participatory, by the way, especially during the message. Well, receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, wave your finger like this, all right, as a wave offering before the Lord. Now, receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit and find, can you find three other people? Just make eye contact and they, there's hope from a tomb. There's hope from a tomb. Say it like you mean it, mean like you say it. There's hope from a tomb. What do I mean by hope from a tomb? I'm talking about our hope from Christ's resurrection, our hope from Christ's resurrection. I'm just going to share two things about what the empty tomb, Christ's resurrection, represents and means to all of us. And it is life-changing indeed. You know, I want to set the backdrop as we read here. It said the women. All the ladies, can I get an amen, all right, in the house? All the ladies, all the sisters, can I get a loud amen, all right? This is how amazing our God is. The first ones to go see Jesus after the crucifixion were not the men, but the women. Maybe they were more spiritual than the men. And they're on there, and it was like a morning like today. Beautiful, sunny, the birds chirping. And they're going, but they're going with a mix of emotions. Fear to a tomb where they had led and they had laid who they thought was their beloved Savior. But he died on the cross few days before but they wanted to embalm his body with spices and they're going there with fear because the Roman soldiers they had sealed the tomb with the rock and they sealed it and they're going to encounter the Roman soldiers how are we going to go and then the rock how are they going to it's an impossibility they had their doubts how are we going to remove it it seems so impossible they had fear they had sadness they had broken dreams. Their hopes in Christ had been dashed and hung on a cross and died and had been buried. Much in the same way, we came, and I, some of you came in wonderful Easter garb, and that's great. Maybe things are going for you, but if we're really honest with ourselves, all of us have areas of our lives that are not hunky-dory. Some areas that are broken, that we need some hope. Maybe there is a broken relationship, a broken family a broken pain in your life, maybe it's loneliness, whatever it is, maybe it's fear of your life and what's going to happen. Maybe it's insecurities, all these things. And it's like that these women were coming to a tomb, but they found that the tomb was empty. Can I get an amen to that? And so from that, I want to let you know that they came to an empty tomb. They found that Jesus was gone, and the angel said, he is not here, he is risen. And without the resurrection of Christ, Christianity would be a farce. It would be a joke. But because it is the resurrection and the truth, Jesus has saved tens of millions of people all throughout the ages. For those who became sinners, became saints through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen to that? So I want to share with you two things. Two things. Everybody say two things. Right? About this hope that we have from this empty tomb. The first is... We're no longer a prisoner of the past. Oh, can I get an amen to that, right? Point to someone next to you and say, you're no longer a prisoner of your past. You're no longer a prisoner of your past. 
In other words, what I'm saying is whatever you identify with in your life that has happened, whether what you've done or what someone else did to you and you've been marked or scarred by that and you identify that, I want to let you know the good news of, of Jesus Christ is that you are not what you did or what someone did to you. You are what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. He has the last word, and his final work, what he did, is makes all the difference. He takes all of our sins and all the sins that others have done unto us, all of our failures, and he died on the cross, paid for it, and he took it into the grave. Oh, can I get an amen to that? And not only did he do that, he purchased, everybody say purchased. All of our debts and all of our sins, all the, in our indebtedness, he purchased it. And made all of our debts. I don't want to see a show of hands, but some of you who are in debt right now, your credit card, mm-hmm. You're like $20,000 in credit card debt, mm-hmm. And you're the favorite customer for Citibank because they love charging that interest. Some of us are in debt. I want to let you know all our sins, we're all indebted, but Jesus paid it and made it zero balance. But you know what the good news is? He didn't keep it zero he gave you credit. He said, all your future debts of sins, after you accept me, they're all going to be paid for already in advance. And so he purchased all of our debts, but he also purchased your life. So you don't have to be called a debtor or someone in debt. You become from slave to a son or daughter of God. So I want to let you know, what you might be saying, where do I get this? It says here in verse 1, on the first day of the week. Everybody say first day of the week. If you ever think about why when the Bible number seven is the number for completion and perfection, why didn't God the Father make Jesus rise from the grave on the seventh day, the perfect and complete day? Because we know that the first day, like Sunday, is the beginning of a new week. So Jesus paid for it all, all our debts, and he canceled all the debt of our sins, and then to show that it was on a new beginning that he made the perfect, complete work of Christ. And then a new beginning, the first day, Sunday of a new week, that's when the women went to the tomb. And I don't know who this is for, for good news for you. Some of you, you've died and buried your dream, your marriage, your hopes for your children. Some of you students, you think my life is over because I didn't get into that school. I'm in debt. I'm facing the same issue over and over and over again. And you feel like your life has become entombed. But I want to let you know that Jesus broke open that grave. And he wants to let you know that when you come to Christ, as Christ was died and buried, and he took all of our debt and sin, and he was buried, he broke out of it. And to let you know that it's a new beginning. Point to someone to say it's a new beginning, all right? And then verses 2 to 3 says, they found a stone, what seemed impossible to the women. Humanly speaking, it was rolled away. And when they entered, they did not find the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have good news. That the truth is, the body of evidence that you're a debtor or a sinner, that you're a failure, that you're a mistake, you can't find it in Jesus Christ. It's all taken care of. So let me try to illustrate it in this way. Imagine this box as your life. Let's be honest. We're all right now, who you are right now is an accumulation, a cumulative of experiences, of truth and knowledge and learnings and education, good and bad, suffering, successes, failures, what people have said to you that were encouraging. Or maybe somebody like a parent in a moment of anger said, oh, I wish you were never born. Or your mistake. You're never going to amount to anything. All these experiences, we put it into our life in this box. And so this is what happens over time. We're all sin. No one's perfect. We make mistakes, and we go through that, and so we feel like, oh, man, I have my sins, and I'm marked by my sin. Then we have regrets. <sighs> I wish I didn't do that. I wish I'd have didn't take that foolish decision. Then we have our failures. Failed business, failed relationships, 
failing as a parent, failing as a child, failing as a student, not matching up and meeting people's expectations. Then after failures, we feel shame. Everybody say shame. I want to put it in our closets. We come, smile, act all tough, but inside, we're shameful of things that we've done, part of our lives. Then we all make mistakes. No one's perfect. We all have our mistakes, big and small. And then we have loneliness, especially after this pandemic. Loneliness is on an all-time high. The funny thing is you're, le- you're connected more than ever electronically through social media. But that doesn't last. And people are going through loneliness more than ever. Maybe you're lonely today. Then we have pain. Some of you, and I want to say a good word of encouragement. Those of you in pain and you want to lessen the pain by hurting yourself, don't do it in Jesus' mighty name. You're hurt because someone hurt you or you've hurt yourself now. And we're going through that. And yet Jesus saw that and took it all on the cross. Then as a result, we are insecure. Point to someone and say, don't be insecure. Now point to the other person that, you, that was your second choice. Say, don't be insecure. The truth is, all of us are insecure. Pastors, leaders, everyone, if we're really honest, we have some areas of insecurity in our lives. I mean, it's part of our lives. Then we have brokenness. Sin breaks things. We're all broken people, aren't we, if we're really honest? You don't have to be having a special needs like my daughter. She got broken because of her meningitis when she was 16 days old. But all of us are broken. It could be emotionally. It could be relationally. What someone did, we're all broken people. If we're really honest and raw. And then not only that, dear friends, then we have rejection. We get rejected. We feel rejected by people. And even right now, for those of you newcomers, that's why we want to make sure you feel so well. You're wondering, are there people liking me? Are they, are, they, are they accepting me? Then we have fears. Everybody say fears. Fear of death. Fear of loneliness. Fear of the future. All these things. Then we have our worries. Point to someone and say, don't worry. And some of you are worrying about not worrying. So we worry all the time. And Jesus says, don't worry, but it's so hard not to. Then what happens is our fears and our worries then lead to anxieties. Anxiety is a combination of our fears and our worries. And we start really acting it up even further. Then we have condemnation. Maybe you are here and you feel condemned. You hear the enemy condemning you saying, God doesn't love you like he loves the person next to you. Could you, you could fool others, but look what you've done. And we feel all this condemnation. And then we feel betrayal. Jesus experienced all of these things. He felt betrayal. He got betrayed by J- Judas and his disciples that he invested for three years. They all ran for their lives. And then we have sorrows. Some of you are dec- discouraged and you have many sorrows and you're crying those tears by yourself asking, are you there, God? Some of you are going through depression. You're depressed. No matter what, you smile, but you feel so depressed inside. Finally, we all have our weaknesses. Whatever it may be, we have all these things. And these are things that we've accumulated over time in life. And that's what happens to us. But I want to let you know this, dear friends. This is your life, and then somehow it becomes a tomb. You try to fill it with money, vacations, all these things, but you can't get rid of it. It's still there. Your insecurities, your fears, they're all there. Try to put more money into it. New car, new purse, new shoes. You try to put it, but it's mixed in, and you still have all those shame and all these things there. But the good news, dear friends, is that 2,000 years ago on Good Friday, Jesus took all of our sin all of our brokenness, all of our weakness, and he nailed it on the cross for you and I. You don't have to carry it. Jesus carried it and paid for it fully on the cross of Calvary. Oh, can I get an amen to that right there? So everything that's broken in life caused by sin, 
Jesus took it on the cross and he paid for it. And all that is in our lives because of a sin and brokenness and our mistakes and our fears and our shame. He took it all on the cross of Calvary and paid it completely, paid in full. Everybody say paid in full, all right? And so that's what Jesus did. And that's why he says, I died for you so that you could have eternal life. And that's why we don't have to be a prisoner of the past anymore. But it doesn't stop there. The second hope of the hope of resurrection of the empty tomb is that we're still a prisoner. We're no longer a prisoner of our past. But I don't know about you, but those of our Christians, we're a prisoner of unfailing hope. Can I get an amen to that? You're a prisoner of one or the other. Either to your past and your shame and your brokenness. Or you become a prisoner. I cannot be freed from this unfailing hope of Jesus Christ. That he paid for all of my sins. And yes, you will still make mistakes a year from now, even later on today. But I have this unfailing hope that Jesus paid for all of my sins, past, present, and future. I have this unfailing hope that if he's the Lord over my life, he's going to work all things out for the good somehow. Oh, can I get an amen to that? Somehow I may get sick. Somehow something I may lose my job. Somehow these hardships may happen. But I know that God's in full control because I've asked him to be my Lord and Savior. So he'll work all things out. And therefore, I have this unfailing hope for the present that right now God is Emmanuel, God with us. And that for the future, I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about what school I'm going to get into, what's going to happen. I don't know where my finances are going to be in the future. Because if I surrender it all to Jesus, he will be the king and lord over it. And whenever I surrender, he says, I'll be responsible for it. But whatever you keep in your own hands, you're going to be responsible by your own effort and strength. So that's why those of us who place our faith and hope in Jesus Christ, we are a prisoner of unf unfailing hope. And let me be raw and honest with you. Those of you who know our, our church know me. Though. But, you know, um, we all go through hardships. I have moments where, you know, um, with our special needs daughter, she sometimes, because her special needs, not her fault, she acts up and all that, and she repeats things, and it gets hard. And sometimes the enemy will come and say, nothing's going to ever change. This is your lot. Sometimes you let the enemy speak to your voice and you get down and you start feeling down and discouraged and depressed and all these things. And then I, all of a sudden, I can't stay down because the Holy Spirit inside every believer won't let you stay down. He's going to say, are you going to keep on believing the lies of the enemy? You're going to start believing my words of life. Do you think I make mistakes, Stephen? Yes, there's suffering and pain in this world because you live in a broken world. But everything that surrendered to me, and you surrendered your daughter to me, and cherished your daughter, accepted Jesus Christ when she was a young age. So I got this. Can I get an amen to this? God was saying. And so because of that, I may be down, but then uh, my wife always knows the next day I'm like, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Because I have a hope for the present and for the future. You know, my dad, um, bless his heart. Her mom's here. She's been living with us for seven years. My dad passed away from cancer uh, seven years ago. And um, he wasn't a believer for the uh, first 21 years of marriage. Point to someone saying, that's a long time. That's a long time. And um, because when he wasn't a Christian, he would come home from Hewlett Packard smelling like alcohol, drunk, be angry. And he would, sometimes because of his drunken stupor, he would get violent. And I grew up in that context for some time. And I remember I was in a fetal position in my bedroom. And I said, I promise I will never, ever be like my dad when I grow up. But praise be to God, this is how God works all things for the good. After 21 years, because my mom didn't give up on her husband, kept on praying. You're going to save him, God. You're going to save him, God. And you're going to save him. And he became a believer. Can we give God a hand clap of praise for that? Amen. And after that, everything changed. He became such a wonderful, wonderful father and husband. That's how Christ can change our lives. Can I get an amen? And so he changed. But because of what we had earlier on for all those years, 
my relationship with my father still wasn't exactly the way that I was hoping for. But I want to let you know that God makes dead things come alive. Why does God allow some things, your hopes and your dreams and all that die? Because it has to die in the flesh so that God could make it come alive in the spirit. In your own flesh, you can't make it happen. Your marriage, your children, your hopes. But when the Holy Spirit comes because you surrender to God, God can make all dead things come alive in Jesus Christ. That's why it says in verse 5, in their fright, the women bowed down with their face to the ground. But the man, the angel said to them, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? And then in verse 6, he is not here. Jesus is not here. He has risen. So I'm going to let you know, when you surrender your life to Jesus, everything that you surrender to Jesus comes alive. It may not be exactly what you expected or you envisioned or pictured, but it comes alive according to God's very best for our lives. And so that's why, dear friends, it says that uh, in Romans 8.28, I want us to read it out loud together. Let's read it together, one, two, three. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to what? His purpose. It's the condition that those who love him, those who know God, surrender their life over to Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and those who are called according to his purpose. And let me say it this way, dear friends. We're all an amalgam of all the things that have happened to us, and Jesus paid for it all. But all the bad things that have accumulated and added up, they can only turn for good when you surrender to our good Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you do that, He'll work it all out in his due and perfect and wonderful time. So that's what happened to your friends. So all that Christ is asking of us is simply this. I died for it, and I offer you forgiveness, payment of all your sins, so that I can make all your mess that you've accumulated and make it into something beautiful. And he's saying, this is what the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is, is if you would open your heart, bring it, to the altar of Jesus Christ. And you say, Lord, here am I. I identify with you. I surrender my life to you. All my brokenness and all my pain and all my sorrows, I surrender it over to you. And when you do that, dear friends, what happens is simply this. When you ask Jesus, you open your heart and you ask Jesus to come into your heart and take care of all your mess and all your pain and all your sorrows. What happens is he paid for it all, and he makes it empty. Gone. Everybody say gone. gone. Completely paid and negated and canceled in Jesus Christ. Oh, can I get an amen to that? Completely gone. Some of you are saying, what happened? It's a little magic trick. But I think... Man only does magic tricks, but Jesus does miracles. But I want to let you know, we try to cover it up with everything. But when Jesus comes, he doesn't cover it. He makes it paid for fully and negates it, dear friends. So I want to just encourage you. That's what Jesus does for all of us. And it's all about not having a religion. But you may be asking, okay, I understand all that, but so whatever I say, so what? So if we go to the next slide, the so what part of it is simply this. You need to believe because bottom line, dear friends, all of us are believers. Even atheists who don't believe in God still believe. You know why? It takes faith to believe, but it also takes faith to not believe. I've had atheists say, Pastor, I don't believe in God. I said, you just used the word believe. I don't believe in God. That means you put your faith in the chance that there is no God. So regardless, if you're a Christian, you put your faith in Christ. An atheist puts their faith in the hopes that there is no God. And so it requires faith either way. Are you tracking with me? Can I get an amen, right? And the real truth is, truth is not just knowledge. It's a person. It's in Jesus Christ. If you don't believe me, think of it this way. How many of you, um, I don't, I'm not, you don't have to show of hands, but I love baseball. Right now, I love 
Shohei Otani of the uh, um, uh, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Two-way player, pitcher, throws 100 miles per hour, hits like 500-foot bombs, like 46 home runs last year. He was MVP for the whole Major League Baseball. So I, I really am a huge fan of his and all that. But, and I know all the facts about him because I, I, I'm one of those types, I look at his stats every day. Go to the ESPN app. He went two for five, his batting average. So I know all the facts about him. I know all the facts, the truth about him. I know everything about him. I know he won AL MVP. I know he won all these other awards. I know all the things. I know what his best pitcher, pitch is. Huh? I know all these things. I know all these facts about him, but he doesn't know me. In the same way, we can know all the facts about Jesus. I could recite all the things, but he doesn't know me. And so truth is not just information. It's in a person called Jesus Christ. And so as a result, it's about not just a religion of rules and knowledge and all that, but having a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know some of you are saying, Pastor, I'm an intellectual. I went to college, and I, went, I studied science. I don't believe that this, ha I believe all in random chance, evolution. Well, let me, uh, the example is right in your hands. Everybody say right in your hands. Um, I have here the iPhone 13. So if I put it here, or even on the ground, and just walking, Sunday stroll, and you come upon it, and you and I are walking, and we see an iPhone standing there. And then you look at me and say, Pastor, this iPhone came about through random chance. The winds and all the elements, all these carbon based it just came together to make the circuitry and the battery, the cell battery, everything. The wiring, perfect. So it became this. And you say, there's no God. There was no designer. It all happened by random chance. And I would say you're pretty foolish. Apple designed it. Now, but you say, no, it happened by random chance. I said, no, you're, you're, you're pretty foolish. Well, do you know that the mitochondria in a cell, not even the cell, but the mitochondria in a human cell is far more complex than any iPhone 13? And yet we say there is no such an intelligent designer, divine designer, but we know that when we see something, it's impossible for this to have happened unless there was the designer. Are you track with me? Can I get an amen, right? So in the same way, if a mitochondria is even far more complex than a cell phone, of course there is a divine, divine designer. And the way to him is through Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, dear friends, it's about being right with God and having a right, relig right relationship over a religion. You know, I knew my father, as I, as I wrap things up, my, my father was my dad. I knew all the facts about him, and I know that I'm supposed to be his son and all that. But until after he became a Christian, I realized that my relationship with him was just kind of more or less like rules and regulations. Yeah, I got to please my dad. I got to do all these things. Maybe get him to approve if I do well in school, get all these grades and all this stuff. But my relationship with my dad was still kind of distant. I knew all the facts, and I knew that he was my father, and I was a son, all these things, but we weren't together. But this is how God works all things for the good of those who love him. After he became a Christian, I became a Christian before he did, and my family of three were all Christians now. But this is how God works all things for the good of those. It's about not just faith, but having a right relationship. My dad changed and he became one of the most gentle encouraging men i've ever met he became my best friend and then he starts speaking words of life saying steven i'm so proud of you and all and we just i never would have Im imagined that my relationship with my father would be like this and then i was a pastor and i'm an only child that's a lot of pressure everybody say that's a that's a lot of pressure all right being an only child is a lot of pressure and then because you know how your parents i don't know if they did this intentionally but they kind of it rubbed on me the wrong way. Oh, you know Mr. Lee's family? All four of their kids pulled their money together and sent them off on a, a two-week cruise. 
And, you know, they bought him a car, their father a car. And I'm like, only child. I can't afford all this stuff. And I just thought, oh, this, this. But this is how it is, dear friends. When you surrender over to your life to God, he works all things good and bad. Whether you have a lot or a little, he works things, all things out for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Seven years ago, my mom calls me and says, your dad has cancer. And they lived in the East Coast, and so I started flying back and forth, and we found out that it was terminal. The doctor said he's going to live probably like four to six months. With chemo, maybe extended to a year, my dad, who became a believer, said, Stephen, I don't want to have to suffer through chemotherapy. I lived a good life. God's been good to me. If it's my time to go, let me go. You know why he said this? Because he was not scared of death. He knew that death was only a passing into eternity to be with Jesus up in heaven. So we try to tell him, no, Dad, you're going to survive. You're gonna, God's going to heal. No, no, no. It's my time to come. I, so he refused to get chemotherapy and all that. And then it was getting worse and worse, so I flew him out to live with us in California. And I'm an only child, and my dad's condition got worse. He got catatonic. He could barely speak. He just looked like a zombie couldn't move, so I had to help him carry him to the bathroom and all these things. Almost every hour in the middle of the night, he felt like he needed to go to the restroom. So my mom would call me, and I would come and pick him up because he couldn't move, take him to the restroom, help him, help wash his hands, and carry him back. I would have to give him a shower and hold him up so he'd be standing in the shower. Didn't dry him with a towel. I remember I took him back one time to his bed he was sitting just looking catatonically and I started noticing he needs some lotion so I'm putting lotion on him my dad could barely speak all of a sudden I felt him just patting my shoulder saying that's my boy that's my son I'm so proud of him and then I prayed for him to be saved to be healed. And God didn't answer that. And he went and he died. And he had him buried nearby here in El Toro Memorial. And my mom just asked me, it's Easter, when are you going to take me to the graveyard site? The first time after he got buried, we were going to the memorial. And my, it was my mom and I I wanted to take because she missed my father. And then he said, Stephen, I want you to know your dad tried to talk to me. And he said to me one time, I have the best son in the whole wide world. I've never seen a son that sacrificed so much for his father. And when my mom said that, I started crying in the car. I said, Mom, I couldn't take you to nice vacations send you off. I couldn't buy you nice cars or anything. But then my mom said, your father saw how you picked him up every hour, took him to the bathroom, washed him up. She did things that money could never buy. And because of that, he died so happy with the son that he had. And I say this because my relationship with my father, I knew about him, was broken. But in Christ, God does exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine, dear friends. Not only will he resurrect you, he will do exceedingly more than you could ever ask or imagine. Oh, can I get an amen to that? And so, you know what my dad's, one of his last wishes was on his tombstone, if you will, his little grave marking. He said, Stephen, I want people to come to Jesus Christ. I wish I would remember to put up a picture here. Maybe you'll see it if I post it. If you follow me on Instagram or whatever, I'll post it when I take my mom. But on his tombstone, it says, believe in Jesus. He will save you. And as I close, I want to encourage all of you here today. It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. Truth is a person in Jesus Christ. 
And what God wants from each and every one of us is we all have a brokenness in our relationships. And maybe something seems so impossible, but I want to let you know that you come to the Lord and you bring your life to the altar, which is the cross. And bring it to the foot of the cross and say, God, here's my brokenness. I'm going to be real honest with you. It's the truth that sets me free. This is who I am. And I come and I come and I just open my heart to you. And I surrender everything to you. Here's my mess. I don't want to stay the same anymore, God. I go to church every once in a while, and it's still the same. I'm trying to just keep things on my own strength. But if you come to Christ and you surrender, he will take it on the cross, and he'll pay for it and cancel all our brokenness and pain and make it into an empty tomb. Oh, can I get an amen to that? That's what Christ's invitation is today. And like I said, you are an answer to prayer. Because we love you with the love of Jesus. Most importantly, I hope you sense God loves you. And you are his child. And he sees how sin has separated us from a holy God. And he made sure that you would not perish. So he sent his own son to die on the cross for your sins and mine to show the extent of his love. And he says, I died for all your sins, all your brokenness. Would you just come to Christ and surrender it? Come with your brokenness. Come with your shame. Come with your regrets. Come. And I promise you this, if you come to Christ, you will be forever changed. You will have a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen? You can go home right with God. Can I get a hallelujah to that? Think about it. Your broken relationship just by coming to Christ and God, I need you. Be the Lord. You can go home with your heart and your soul right with God. No more enmity with God. No more separation. No more distance. You could be right with Jesus Christ. And know that there's no condemnation. No more shame. No more regrets. All those failures, Jesus paid for it on the cross. And therefore, that's why I have hope from this empty tomb. And I say, surrender it. Jesus will make all your stuff also. Take it and you identify with Christ. Your old self is buried with Christ and you become a new person alive. So that's what it means. The gospel is surrendering your life and asking him, putting your faith in him to be your personal Lord and Savior. Can we all stand at this time? Let's all stand. And as we stand... Worship team's going to uh, sing a song. And I want to just encourage all of you as you remain standing and that this is a holy moment. I want you to look at these words as you sing it and hear the beckoning voice and invitation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's Christ that brought you here to church today. I really believe that. It's Christ who brought you to church today. Amen. And he's knocking on the door of your heart saying, my child, I see your misery and your pain. Bring it to me. And I will make you a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So we're going to sing this stanza, first and second stanza. Then afterwards, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and then we're going to give an invitation for those of you who need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I'm so excited, is your new birthday. Amen. And you could go home right with God as a child of God. So let's sing this song together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? For Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms.
bow your heads and close your eyes at this time. Every eyes closed, every head bowed. I'm going to say a prayer and then I'm going to ask anyone who's ready to respond to Jesus to say yes to him today. That today can be your new day that you can get right with God. Hallelujah. And go home in a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this amazing group of people here today. You brought them. And now bring them to you, Jesus. Only you can save. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to the heart of every person here who doesn't know you. They may know about you. They may have gone to church. But if they don't truly know you, speak to their hearts right now, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you reveal who Jesus is? And I pray that you'll knock on the door of people's hearts today and saying, I love you so much. And I died for you so that you could have eternal life. And I want to have this eternal loving relationship with you, a re right relationship with you. So Holy Spirit, do what only you can do, I ask in Jesus' name. Those that need to get right with God for salvation, bring them to the cross today. And thank you that they're going to become new creations here today. Those that need to rededicate, Lord, I pray that you will bring them also, Lord God, to you. And know, Lord God, that you're a God of second and third and fourth and fifth chances. You're a God of grace. So, God, have your way. Just surrender everything to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. Amen, amen. I want everyone to look up. I'm going to give an, uh, an altar call and invitation here today. And... The first invitation is simply this. What I may try to convey the good news of Jesus. I'm only a human, but I know this, and I want you to know this. I hope you sense the love of Christ here in this room for you and that he loves you. And you respond to the love of God. And I want to let you know if there's someone here, maybe you've grown up in church. And you've gone to church, you know all the Sunday school stories. But I want to just share the good news with you. The truth is, going to church doesn't save you. Having a relationship with Jesus saves you. And can I encourage you today? If today is the day where Jesus is knocking and saying, I am for real, would you surrender your life to me today, my child? Would you say yes to Jesus? Others of you that have been living and you're trying to make it on your own and you've been living in shame and you're living in regret and condemnation, I want to let you know you could leave here with no more condemnation. Imagine that all your weight and all your burdens lifted because Jesus took that weight on the cross. So can I encourage you today? Let's get real with God. Point of someone next is to get real with God. Get real with God. If you need to say yes to the Lord, let this be the time and invitation to do so. So, Lord, I pray right now you will do it and save those that need to be saved. So right now, everybody look at me. Jesus, the Father's arms are open wide right now. He's inviting you today to come to know the Lord. If those of you who don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, 
you don't have that assurance god forbid if your life was to end today do you have that assurance that you're going to go to heaven if you don't you could go home today with that assurance and confidence just like i know that i'm going to meet my dad up in heaven when my time is up because we're saved by the grace of our lord jesus christ so i implore you say yes to the lord because he loves you with an everlasting love those of you feel the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart and you're saying, God's saying, I love you. Would you give your life over to me? And you want to get right with God and you want to ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And for this is for first time, those of you who don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. I'm not going to play religion anymore. I want to have this right relationship with Jesus Christ. I know he loved me so much. I want to say yes to him. If that's you right now, can you just raise your right hand wherever you are? Just raise it up. And we want to lead you what's called the Believer's Prayer of Salvation. Those of you who need to say yes to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you want to surrender your life over to God today, just on the count of three, just raise your right hand up right now. One, two, three. Raise your hand right on up, right on up. I see a hand going on up. Come on, saints. Anyway, I see another hand going on up. This is your life and chance to say yes to Jesus Christ. Come on, church, give them a big hand clap. The altar call is still not over. Altar, altar call is still not over. If you know that you've tried it on your own and you just had a religion, Christianity is not a religion. It is the truth of a relationship with God. And once you say yes to him, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. So I also want to make it very clear on this because we've had this happen in our church recently. And I think God's way of saying there are people who think that they've grown up in the church that they're saved. But I want to make it very clear. You're saved by a relationship with Jesus Christ. You're not saved by following rules. And, and so, friend, it takes faith to believe in God. It faith, takes faith not to believe in God as well. So I saw those two hands going on up as well. Praise God for that. Amen. All right. But I, I also want to make it very clear as well. The altar call is still open. Those of you who may be sitting on the sidelines and you are just wrestling. I don't want to give up my life. I don't want to give up control. Can I be honest with you? None of us are in full control. We're not in full control of the gas prices. We're not in control of inflation. But I want to let you know as you surrender to the God who is in full control, he will work all things out for the good. So... Those of you who raised your hands, God bless you. Okay, let's one more time. Let's give them a big hand clap. 